the early genesis of it was, you know, given the the range of data that's that potentially is out there that would inform practice, why are we so glommed on to you know looking at the data under the lamppost, which is you know existing student test scores, and so. The idea was, how can we sort of expand that repertoire a little bit, and how can we, how can we um, do that in a framework that lets us understand the influence of that? And the, so the other motivation for the study was the idea that, that there's supposed to be this, this relationship somehow between what, how teachers teach and what they teach and the learning of their students, right? So, so teaching and learning are supposed to be connected together, but by focusing on solely on student test data, we're really emphasizing the learning part, but we're asking teachers to make a lot of inferences back to their teaching. So the idea of the linking study was to more tightly combine teaching and learning together to look at the, the to facilitate teacher conversations about the choices they make inside of the classroom and what that produces in terms of their students' increased understanding. So this was funded by the Spencer Foundation. Um, and we, um, you'll see some of the takeaways at the end. One of the, one of the big things was from the start, we really started to move away from the notion of emphasizing the data and really featuring an investigation of practice with data sort of supporting that activity. So I think in this movement on data use, we're, we're emphasizing data up here, and really it should be a supporting thing, not the lead thing in the story. So that's, that's a big piece of this. Um, so the, the, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting about this was that we, we, we set this up as an experiment, and we used experimentation as a formative mechanism for feedback to the process. So this is something I'm not gonna really talk about here, but um, I, I tracked the learnings and the influence on the intervention from various sources and tried to, to, to identify what contributions the experimental paradigm contributed to, to changing the, um, the, the structure of the intervention. But, so that's sort of a different story. So um, in this study, I worked with a school district in New Jersey, not too far from Philadelphia. Um, and we, um, we recruited teachers in grades one through five um, to participate in, in this process. And this is another, another story that I won't really emphasize here, but the, the heavy hand of accountability really had a huge shadow on people's willingness to be open to, to having their instruction looked at. So that, you know, we, we took elaborate steps to create a firewall that separated the formative opportunity of this process with the district's accountability system. And even with all kinds of things, including videotaped um, um, introductions and support from the superintendent, which I guess could be a double-edged sword, but in this case, I think was a was a, was a supporting thing, and um, to um, to um, commitments from principals to stay away from this process so that it was that it was teacher focused. Um, so all kinds of you know to IRB commitments to all kinds of statements about how this formative feedback process was over here and accountability was over here, and they're not connected together, they're, they're separated. Even, even then, you know, lots of feedback from teachers about how reticent they were to participate in this kind of thing. And I think that's another story that's really important, one that I won't focus on here. Um, so we focused on math instruction in, in grades one through five. The district was using investigations, but it was, it was a, a, a strange combination because they were using investigations, but they were supplementing it with Scott Forsman. Um, which is much more um, traditional content oriented stuff so um, so we um, so our structure was to focus on the investigations units and the the the, um, the intervention looks something like this so um, we picked a set of units um, we asked 
teachers, instead of observing instruction, we asked them to videotape a lesson. Um, we used the videotaped lesson to focus on two key aspects of instruction, which were came out of the literature but also came out of instrumentation. So we used um, LDRC's um, 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 rubrics around um, IQA, the Instructional Quality Assessment, and which focuses on academic rigor and accountable talk. So our focus was on those two key concepts. We had folks um, who were grad students watch the videotapes and write qualitative feedback that we emailed back individually to the teachers in the study or to the group, to the treatment group. And they, um, these were feedback around those two mechanisms or, or around accountable talk and academic rigor. And we wanted that feedback, we know that the shelf life of feedback is pretty short, so our commitment was to try and get this back to teachers within five days of the lesson. And so we would send that by email and that was sort of a private, um, private set of feedback. Um, we went through lots of processes to construct that in a way that was balanced so that people would receive it um, in the way that we intended it. Um, and then at the end of the unit, um, when after teachers had given their end of unit assessment, there was a facilitated conversation in a PLC, which harkened back to the videotaped lessons. As a matter of fact, we, we, selected, comp we selected clips, essentially, of accountable talk that were connected to the key themes of the unit that were represented in the end of unit assessments. So we tried to make this link linking between the teaching that teachers, the choices that teachers made in their, in their instruction and, um, and performance on the end of unit assessments. So these are the two components of that. So, so um, they looked at video clips of Accountable Talk and then the other piece was they looked at um, student problem solving strategies in their end of unit assessments and Caroline Ebby's not here but she really <coughs> laid the groundwork for this and so the idea wasn't to look at the distribution of performance of your students at the end of the unit. The idea, and this is very much aligned with a lot of the formative assessment literature, is, is we had teachers take their, their focus on a couple of, of open-ended end of unit items and sort students according to the strategies that they use to focus on the the depth of student understanding and then try and link that to the ways that teachers engage with students um, on the same content through the video clip. So we're really trying to make tight connections between these two things. So retrospectively? Yeah. Right. Well, it, at the end of their unit, right? right? So, so looking so, back, they, they right. did, saw what they did. Right, okay. right. right. So, this, this whole process occurred in, um, in three cycles over the course of the year, so it depended on the, the, the curricular sequence for that particular grade level. So we picked three units that had some, some progression across them with the idea that this feedback would be more useful if you had another opportunity in that same domain to engage with these concepts. So we did this for three cycles. And so this was the intervention. Um, we were focusing on, you know, on looking at the effects of this in an experimental paradigm. Um, and so our data included, um, we had pre-post surveys, we had, um, we had a, a, what we called an exit slip, which was a, a survey right at the end of, a, of their professional learning community meeting. Um, we had the videotapes where we gave qualitative feedback to teachers, but we were using the IQA to rate them according to um, the University of Pittsburgh's um, two dimensions of academic rigor and accountable talk. Um, so there were rubrics that existed to rate the, the quality of instruction externally. And then we had end of unit um, test performance. So the research design basically looked like this. Um, teachers were randomly assigned within PLCs, so the conversations occurred in PLCs, so we had to randomly assign within PLCs. Um, the treatment group got this intervention, 
The control group, um, really, the, the district had a way of looking at student test data that actually we had helped to develop prior in the, in the development of the study. That So teachers in the control group used the protocols in their PLCs to look at student work. They weren't facilitated conversations and they didn't get feedback on their teaching. They were just looking at um, their end of unit test data, which is sort of the, the situation as usual, right? Um, and then we had pre and post surveys. Um, we had raters who were rating the, the lessons. Um, we, had, we had exit slips at the end of each PLC. And then we did some interviews with teachers as well. So I'm just going to report on some of these data. There's really, there's several pieces that have come out of this. Um, Caroline, who was one of the facilitators. So, what, you know, district stories are always interesting backdrop to these things, right? So when we started the study, the district had 11 coaches. And we envisioned using the coaches as the facilitators of the PLC conversations. By the time we actually got to do the study, they had one coach. And um, so we had, um, we supplemented that with, with our own person. So we, ended, we had two coaches doing all the facilitation. One was the district math coordinator who was, who was a non-supervisorial um, coach in the district. And we also had um, our, our person. And um, the, so the, um, so the, so the, another difference between treatment and control was the facilitation of those conversations. Um, oh, and then we had end of unit test data. Okay, so I'm going to focus on some of the results. What I was saying before was that we, that the person who worked for us, who did the coaching, wrote a fantastic piece on the on coaches' moves inside of PLCs. So the whole idea of how do you navigate sometimes by design and sometimes on the fly as you're trying to facilitate those conversations. And part of our data that's really interesting and provocative that I want to do more with either now or in a subsequent study is we had an opportunity to, to um, systematically um, um, record and transcribe some of those conversations and just the nuance of the ways in which teachers would either avail themselves of the opportunity or deflect off the opportunity towards like a safer space or towards a, or changing the conversation really I think had huge influence on the extent to which teachers engaged where in the space that we wanted them to engage in. And so I think sort of a micro-analysis of that would be really interesting and probably um, give us some insights about, about the kinds of conversations we'd like to have. So I'm really focusing on the results here. So, so um, these are results from the exit slips and these are teachers' perceptions of, the, of um, what they learned in their PLCs about instruction and about their students' thinking. And you can see that at all three time points, at the end of all three PLCs, there were sig significantly greater um, self-reports of learning about both instruction and about student thinking. So that comes from out exit slips, that self-report data. Um, impacts on um, instruction. So these are the ratings of the, the external judges of the academic rigor and accountable talk of the lessons. Um, the interesting thing is that at time one, which if you go back to the design, time one occurred, um, the, the lesson was videotaped before any of the treatment occurred, because the treatment really didn't occur until you got feedback at the end of unit, um, at the end of the unit, and at both time one in both cases there was no effect, which it may be a consequence of, of the success of random assignment, right? So the groups were equivalent to start with. But that at both time two and time three, there were large effects or, or significant effects um, on, on both academic rigor and accountable talk. The effect sizes were about um, between a, 
a third to a half of standard deviation. So, so what's, um, what's the metric here? What, what are we? What is? The, these are these are these are rating scales of external raters on um, on three dimensions of academic rigor and four dimensions of account of talk. Um, and then this is impacts on student performance. Um, so we the. The slopes of these two lines are significantly different. There's no significant difference at any time point, but overall, um, there was a much smaller effect on student performance on the end of unit assessments, right? So this was an assessment aligned with the the intervention, but still a significant student impact. That's kind of a big effect, actually. So Phil, you you helped me to construct this. So yeah, well, these are these are the um, adjusted means. Less means from, from the uh, student impact analysis, and as John said, probably due to the sample size, the the, the model treatment effect was significant. The LS means were not different between groups, so it's you know it's it's um, you know, and we, we could convert these as well into uh, Cohen's D. Yeah, that's our next step. Yeah. Right. Um, so, but a significant effect on student learning, I think that's important. Um, and the, the other thing that's interesting is on the pre and post surveys, we asked about um, importance and proficiency of using data. And there were absolutely no effects on teachers' perceptions of their use of data. And you know, I attribute that in part to the intervention and the focus on the on the substance as opposed to the, 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 the tools that you use to get at instruction. But, um, but you know, I think that this is important because often these so-called data interventions sort of put the cart before the horse, right? They focus on data as opposed to the, the practices that the data are supposed to influence. And so I think here we were trying to, to reverse that. Do you that. think that the use of the word data has any uh Influence. I mean, I looking at your design. Mm -hmm. um, I would say people are looking at evidence of, of that instruction. Yeah. But like yeah. end of unit the, test data, the, the right? The colloquial use of data, you know, tends to be right. Not so these are scales about yeah. a whole bunch of different things. So you know, so my use of data. I got to go back to the questions to see it, the extent to which I forefronted the term data. But you know, perhaps. So three of the four. Uh, Measures the control group that was using less data thought data was more important for the treatment group, right? Well, it's not using. It's not using. It's how how proficient you feel to use. Okay, it's still pretty interesting, right? Well, yeah, it's. I mean, uh, but they're non-significant. There's yeah, there's really right. no differences. But, between do you think they realize? It looks as though they didn't realize what you were asking them. They're, yeah, they're, they're answering different right. questions. Well. I, again, I'd have to go back to the individual questions, right? This is my yeah. naming of a construct, right? Not the actual items that people receive. But, you know, I think that, at, that they were basically, you know, how proficient do you feel to use your students' end of unit test data? I mean, that might have been a question here, right? So, so. But that wasn't what your intervention was about. But it was about analyzing your student test data. <laughs> so perhaps I mean you know the the you know we 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 started out thinking we were more about data and as we went along we started to think less and less about this was a this was a data use kind of intervention. And you're giving them feedback on rigorous yeah. rigor and uh, accountable talk. That's not data. It's not. Yeah. That's data about them. But it's not. <laughs> I mean, they're dealing with. That's something they wouldn't call data. They're, they're dealing with what's happening. Right. Well, I actually think that's an important takeaway, right? Yeah. So, you know, so one takeaway is to connect what you do to what it produces and all the messiness of that. Another is to present it in a way that's natural. I think that that we often try and give teachers data and then ask them to use sort of the the techniques and metrics that we're comfortable with to look at those data, and that seems like a, a you know. A, Asking them to apply a skill set that they don't naturally that aren't naturally fluent in. Um, that um, the third one I think is is the point we've been talking about. 
and then um, focusing on high leverage um, activities. And then this last one about putting a putting a separation between <coughs> between data for feedback purposes and data for accountability purposes. And I think there's a real tension between those two. So that's it. Um, so general thoughts and then we can break into table conversation. Would you do you think there's any effect with you would imagine you would do six cycles. Right. How long did the cycle take? What was it? So a, a cycle was a curricular unit, basically. <coughs> So, so no, so um, longer than that, no, like, like, yeah, four to four to five weeks. So, so how often was it? Was the so there were the, depending on the grade level, units ranged. There were it ranged from like six units across the year to maybe ten units across the year. So we did anywhere from a half to a third of the units, basically. Um, you know the the. <coughs> Trying to disentangle the components of this is even hard for me to think about because I think that we innovated in terms of just looking at test data. So I think sorting your students by their solution approaches as opposed to by who got fours, who got threes, who got twos, and focusing on the strategies that students used was an intervention in and of itself. And then connecting that to instruction, I think, was like sort of another layer of this, right? So, so disentangling those two are hard to do, but but I definitely think that that the the design of of doing that process and then and then teachers knowing they were going to do that process again repeated times across the year certainly had them sort of trying to make connections to subsequent times. Is that sort of where you're heading? Yeah, I mean, I'm heading toward you know, the intensity of the intervention. Right. For, you know, and at uh, and, and what level did you start with? Were these, were these teachers already using accountable talk? So they. That's what you're asking. Yeah. For the so form. I think those are an important question. So one, one thing is this district had been working, had been focusing teachers on. Um, on engaging in PLCs for several years before this. So background work had been set. Um, I think they were getting more and more refined about what they were doing inside of those PLCs. Right? So I think they started out with sort of loose notions of each, um, they were following the DuFours model. Lisa and I did a lot of observations of these way back when. But they were following the DuFours model of like, Literally, each PLC, each grade level teacher team, like setting their own vision and you know doing visioning and stuff, which was like very expansive, right? And then they were slowly focusing it down to to working on um, on instructional things. Some were facilitated, some weren't facilitated. Um, they had stronger sort of routines in some of their PLCs than than um, or some of their. Um, like in ELA, they had stronger routines than they did in math early on. Um, but they did have a culture of doing that, and I think that was important. Um, the, the, the videotaping part of this, as Heather will probably attest to, was, like, was incredibly difficult for us to pull off, right? So one thing that we, you know, that with earlier technology, um, you know, now you can, I think, put a put a, a cell phone um, video, and you can just sort of have that track stuff. But so um, so, just working through those issues and getting people into classrooms to videotape was a big deal. Um, one thing that we that I think really helped us early on was the idea that that we decided we we're going to videotape teachers doing the same lesson within the unit. So that might not have been on the same day, but it was the same piece of the of the unit, and that helped with the commonality of the conversation because people weren't talking about they they weren't talking about different things. Everybody got feedback on the same piece of the unit, which I think helped. Um, one thing that we we 
stumbled upon early on was to use subs in the district as the videographers. And that was a really helpful thing because A, we didn't have to go through the fingerprinting and getting people permission to be in classrooms. And B, the videographers were people who teachers knew and who kids knew. Right? So, so the camera might have been different, but the person behind the camera wasn't different. And so I think that was something that we really stumbled upon. Uh, so, how, how generic was the feedback you gave on, on rigor and on the kind of talk? It, you well, it was customized because it was it was about that particular well, teachers. Was, you said that they, I mean, you mentioned then talking about their different student strategies, and so I'm not just getting it right, right. And that kind of stuff. So, rigor is pretty ambiguous. If it right. is about that kind of distinction and saying, look, you were recognizing that, or what, what, right. what were you? So, thinking? so academic rigor, you know, the term academic rigor might be a generic term, but within this framework, it's about the enactment, the, the extent of the rigor of the enactment of the lesson to get at the big ideas that the, that the unit wanted you to get at. That was, that was the definition of rigor. And did you assume the teachers were using the same language, had the same things in their head about what those big ideas were? Or was that part of what you were thinking about? So Lisa, you wrote some of these, these feedback things, so how would you respond to that? I'm putting you on the spot when you didn't. <laughs> this was years ago. Um, so they, they co plan lessons and units together. So they've sort of established sort of the big ideas that they want to accomplish um, in every unit. Sort of like the understanding by but that, but that's also, it's not just that, it's that the curriculum is conveying this is the focus of that of that unit, right? So investigations is saying this is what you want to focus that unit on, right? right? And that this le this lesson has a role in that process, right? Sure. And so so the so that's what we were that's what our feedback was on was the extent to which the enacted lesson contributed to to the 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 goal of the unit, right? That was what the feedback was. Yeah, I, I guess I'm reacting to your mentioning different student strategies, which right. I anticipate I would pay attention to. Right. So, but, but well, the, that the, isn't necessarily the big idea, or maybe it is, but, but it is different. It is something important about the way students think about it. Well, right. So the, so the different student strategies, which is the end of unit test data, that tries to get at the, um, the extent to which students had made progress towards towards fluency in those big ideas as enacted through the the strategies that they were using um, in on the you know on the physical manifestation of their understanding which is the test, right? Is that yeah. Okay. Sorry, got that? Eric. John, did you have a sense of whether teachers found the email feedback more valuable than uh, um, PLC feedback or vice versa from the differentiation. So um, I think that so one thing was that that we at least in the first round of feedback there was some sense of, of what I would call sort of of um, of um, Hesitancy, or or we hadn't built sufficient trust in you know in send and swooping in and sending people feedback from an anonymous source, right? So, so some te I, I think I think that hitting the right note is challenging. Particular, you know, it's hitting the right note is challenging when I know you, but when I don't even know you, then it's even harder to hit the right note, right? So there were some cases of teachers um, teachers sort of feeling a little bit um, defensive um, from the feedback. But one thing I will say is that, that in interviews with teachers and in observations of the, of the PLC meetings, teachers definitely read them and came in with that in their repertoire for those conversations. So they definitely attended to that. So, so the relative influence, I can't say, but it definitely was something that you know that teachers looked at 
and it, it, the evidence of that was that it was part of the conversation. Did you show the teachers video clips from their practice to sort of match up with um, so that the, the readings so they could sort of see your evidence for choosing your reading? Well, it's from from the teacher's perspective, the ratings were invisible, right? We, from, we the ratings was just for part, for the study part. Or their, their whatever form of feedback you gave them was that text and video. Um, yes, it was text and video. So we we you know, and this was another hard part. We at, teachers had to give us permission to show video clips in their PLCs to their colleagues. Some did not. Some said um, some were uncomfortable, so we had to show video clips from other PLCs. So other teachers who agreed to do this to share them across PLCs in a few cases, um, which I, I think is much less powerful, right? So you're not even seeing yourself or a colleague; you're you're seeing a stranger do something. Um, and um, teachers kind of agreed to rotate. So we we the PL, we didn't have enough time in PLCs to like show video clips of everybody in the three or four person team. So we would rotate across the, the different cycles. Um, but the, the facilitator took the advantage of, of picking video clips that were both high leverage and connected to the end of unit items that they were going to have conversation about. So making that connection was part of the design that, um, that you know, that was part of the preparation of the facilitator of the PLC. So it wasn't just sort of randomly picking a video clip and then looking at test data. There, we tried to connect them together. What was the math? What, 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 what were the content of the units? Um, you know, grades one through five across the year. You know, you know, addition, word. subtraction, multiplication, proportions. Right, whatever you would expect would be. And the assessments were part of the uh, of the of, of investigations, right? So they were investigations assessments <coughs> that had some multiple choice, some you know sort of um, um, some uh, very short answer and some more explain your thinking. And we emphasized the ones that said explain your thinking, right? So we're trying to exploit the ones that really showed how students were thinking about those concepts. Yeah, did the teachers know on the front end? Did they see the rubrics that they were um, that the evaluators were using? We we didn't show we didn't show them the actual rubrics. As a matter of fact, um, the the term instructional quality assessment we thought was too threatening, so we actually renamed it something less threatening than that. Um, but we we definitely showed them the, de the we defined the dimensions of academic rigor and accountable talk for them, but in a teacher-appropriate uh, way, not in an evaluative way. So in some ways, we were separating our, our research study. We are putting a firewall between the research study and the intervention in a lot of ways. So I'm not sure if we should just move to the next conversation, or do we want to break into small conversations? Um, what are your thoughts? I'll decide. Nobody has a thought. <laughs> but one, one problem is we don't know enough to. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay.